Okay, yes, good evening, everyone. Assuming that uh, you're still there and you haven't uh, opted out already. Um, as you see, I've gone slightly for the festive look this evening as it's a light-hearted evening. I've even got, I can show it here, glass of sherry. I hope you've got your suitable drinks. I know there's one or two cups of tea around, but if, if anyone's thinking of getting something a little stronger, you've got a couple of moments. So, right. As, as usual with my presentations, I'm leaning very heavily on the British newspaper archive. Um, for those who may not have heard of that, in collaboration with the uh, British Library, um, the uh, British newspaper archive have scanned uh, just over 46 million pages of mainly regional newspapers running from the mid 1700s up to uh, round about the millennium, about 2000. So yeah, 46 million pages of information which you can search. And by searching on the word Aldbourne, you can get something like 22,000 hits on the word Aldbourne. And I've, over the last uh, three or four years, I've been whittling that down uh, to around about 2000 items, which have some more than just a passing interest for all board. And I'm gonna draw on a few of those more intriguing news items uh, this evening. Uh, we're gonna start way back when, uh, and we're gonna try and work our way through. It's quite lighthearted, I hope. So way back in 1800, the Oxford Journal, uh, it was quite a good source of information about Allborn from time to time. And in August that year, disappeared straight from the copy newspaper. The escaped prisoner, William Haynes, late of Allborn. And he was a butcher who'd stolen a fat ewe sheep. And the, it's the description that is quite nice. Said William Haynes, about five foot nine inches high, stout made with remarkable large <laughs> legs and thighs but a rather thin visage, fair complexion, straight flaxen hair with a downcast look, and walks out at toe. Now, I don't know how often you see people walking out at toe these days, mm. <laughs> but do bear in mind um, William Haynes. Mm. And sometimes wear as a blue butcher's frock, which is appropriate for his profession. And from our point of view, at other times, a light fustian frock. If you're not familiar with fustian, it was a material that was made extensively in Aldbourne, not exclusively so, but it was very much a, a business here for uh, well over 150 years, uh, a tough material, um, which was quite suitable for uh, working class folks, although originally it came from quite the, the top end of fashion, but in later times, it was uh, much more utilitarian material. Anyway, that said, whoever will apprehend old William Haynes and get him to be secured in any of the Majesty's jails, uh, Thomas Reed, then the constable at Allborn, uh, will, uh, will give, and therefore the notifier will receive a ward of 10 guineas okay. to be paid by Thomas Reed, the constable. Okay. So 10 guineas, that's roughly 500 pounds at today's <laughs> values. Ooh. So not an inconsiderable amount of money. So they were obviously determined to get William Haynes, uh, remarkable large legs and thighs <laughs> and walking out of tow. But I don't know whether he was ever captured or recaptured, I should say. We move on a bit, a little bit more down to earth, not so much funny, but interesting. From the Berkshire Chronicle in 1841, there was a report of the population of the Hungerford Union. Now, it's pretty much if the same thing as saying um, the, the whole of the areas, all the parishes in the area covered by the Hungerford Union, which helped uh, the poor. And if you look at the line which says Allborn, I'll put the cursor on. We learned that there were 331 houses in Allborn at that time, which is not an inconsiderable number, of which there were 763 males. 793 females, as usual, just slightly outnumbering the men, and a total of 1,556. 
souls in the parish of Auburn. But it's worth looking at the year on year uh, population of Auburn starting back in 1801 on the right hand side of the screen, uh, around about 1280. Now these were probably not ideal census returns, not as we were used to in later years from 1841 onwards, but they gave a good guide to the number of people in the village. And it's remarkable how over the years, best part of 200 plus years, the figure hasn't varied enormously, unlike many other villages or towns have grown enormously. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, from the 1850s onwards, uh, the population decreased somewhat to reach a, a bit of a low in 1921. <laughs> It'll be interesting, details of that census will be out early next year. And then since 1921, uh, figures have, rose, uh, have risen slowly and we're sort of back and just slightly now above the figures that we had 200 years ago. But overall, it's remarkable how little change there's been. Uh, but of course, in those days, uh, there were uh, fewer houses, bigger families, uh, lots of children didn't all reach a great age, sadly, in those days. But um, uh, an interesting item, if not an amusing one. Now we move on a little bit to 1854. Devises and Wilts Chronicle, another very useful source. The adverts that we get from time to time featuring Allborn are quite interesting. Um, this one, fairly simple, just wanted in a farmhouse, respectable young woman as a governess of Church of England principles. So we, we're still very much uh, under the influence of the different uh, religious regimes to instruct three young children and to make herself generally useful. So uh, quite a straightforward advert. What is, uh, from my point of view, is interesting, but to apply to MN at the post office, Aldborn. So just to sort of establish that was a defined post office here in 1854. It may well have been here earlier than 1854, but that's the earliest direct reference I've found to have a post office in the village. And of course, the Postal Service pretty much established around 1840, 1841 with the Penny Post uh, had become well established in those 14 years. I guess we should be able to work out who the MN was. Uh, yes. There's I a limited number of farms, I guess. Yeah. Certainly with yeah. The... Alan, I also noticed that it says that it's in Berkshire. Yes. Uh, quite often I've found that Allborn is referred to as being in Berkshire. Um, of course, the um, at one time Hungerford was in Berkshire. Uh, sorry, Hungerford was in Wiltshire. Get it the right way round. It didn't change until about the 1890s when they realigned the parishes, and then it slipped into the Berkshire parish. So, um, for some reason, we get linked into Berkshire quite quite frequently. From a post office point of view, um, at that time the postal service here in Auburn came under the main post office at Hungerford. So in the same way that nowadays our postal town is, is Marlborough, um, in those days it was Hungerford. Oh. So that's why it would have been associated with the post office um, saying Hungerford. Okay. Um. Sorry about that, I've jumped ahead where we were talking about that. Right, so this one, uh, Devizes and Wilkes Gazette, 1854 now. And we got a copy of a letter um, from a young man who obviously lived in Auburn. And in fact, he worked for Thomas Chandler. Thomas Chandler was the very progressive farmer who farmed out at North Farm. And uh, as you can see from the heading of this, which I hope is readable for those on reasonable size screens, um, that this chap had emigrated to Australia about 12 months ago. So let's say 1852, um, 1853 or thereabouts. And he was obviously writing from Black Dog Creek. Wonderful, wonderful place to be. And just writing to say a little update back to Thomas Chandler, saying that they'd had an excellent passage sailing out in 82 days, got a job, um, at 25 shillings a week, including board and log uh, lo lodgings. And then as a plaster at 10 shillings a day, 
quite substantial wage rise and then went on to the diggings. Now, of course, that was just about the time that gold had been discovered in um, southern Australia and also in the northeast of Australia. And so there was money to be had. Um, and he stayed there for six months, did very well. Then he drove a team to Melbourne back down in the south. And he's been doing lots of other things and now had 160 pounds. And this is, he wanted obviously to give uh, uh, Thomas Chandler an idea how well a man can do in this colony. Um, crops are good and he hopes to visit England, but he not, doesn't want to come and stay here again. Uh, and it, but at least he thanks uh, Thomas for allowing him to leave his employ. Um, of course, many people who were assigned to work for people um, would have been punished for leaving employment, but obviously this was left with in agreement. And then he goes on to say he'll be hoping to go to new diggings in Buckland River and Reeds Creek. They were both places, uh, one in New South Wales and Reeds Creek up in um, uh, Queensland where gold had been discovered. Then he gives a, an idea of how much uh, things cost down there. And his brother is doing very well, was obviously out there already and has a house worth a thousand pounds. So that's quite substantial. Mm. So I think it's a very nice letter to have been bothered to have been sent all the way back to Auburn uh, to give some idea of conditions out in Australia at that time. And I'd love to know who George um, C is. Um, and I've, I've no way of thinking of getting a, to tackle that one, but if anyone comes up with a bright idea, um, maybe he's on some emigrant um, uh, ships list or something like that. Yeah, I'm almost tempted to have a look at Ancestry Co UK for the emigration shipping yeah. lists. That's right. Not during the talk, but I better not. As Cassie said, it may be possible to track down who that chap, young chap was. Right. A little bit more hard nosed news now. 1868. Um, we've now got a court case of which there are a lot shows up in the um, uh, British newspaper archive and quite a lot refer to Allborn one way or another. Uh, and this is uh, um, the one about uh, the theft of um, a sheep from William Brown. I think William may be listening this evening, not the same William, of course, but the Brown <laughs> family, of course, have farmed in the village for a very long time. Um, but at that stage, they were farming out at Warren Farm. And as the heading says, the sheep was stolen from the fold at night. And there were footprints leading from the field uh, to a sort of bank where the sheep had obviously been killed. And near this spot, marks of wheels, <clears throat> And at eight o'clock on the evening in question, the prisoner was seen driving a cart in the direction of that field. Information passed to the police, went to the prisoner's house and there found the cart on which was a great deal of blood. So it's not looking too good mm -hmm. um, for Elijah Alexandra, but there we are. Um, in the cart was a sack that was covered in blood and wool and there were turnips that had been stolen and several tops and roots left in the ground fitted the turnips found in an outhouse <laughs> belonging to the prisoner. Now that's, that's a clever piece of detective work for the village constable. <laughs> yeah, matching, matching the, uh, uh, the turnip tops. And the police also found a pair of trousers, recently washed but still showing blood traces. And likewise, the prisoner's boots. These were taken to the field and paired with the footmarks and found to correspond. So another piece of forensic work going on, which is quite impressive for 1868. Uh. And although the prisoner tried to account for the blood that he'd been killing a pig, he admitted driving down the road uh, and uh, up and took two men with him. But unfortunately, a sheep's cull was found in the prisoner's house, which he said came from a dead sheep, which he'd found. But um, Obviously, the jury found him guilty, sentenced to five years penal servitude. So quite a harsh sentence, but that's the way things were then. And the, the policeman or inspector, uh, Mould, was complimented on the thoroughness of his investigation. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> a little bit later on, another similar court case. 
uh, involving the crown. Now, the crown featured a great deal in the newspapers because it was the centre, no, no, in the nicest way, it was the centre of social life in those days. The sheer size of the place allowed lots of happenings there, social events, uh, inquiries, um, the um, inquests, and also auctions of property. So very busy place. And at this time, um, Mrs Gould was in charge of the uh, said drinking house. But unfortunately, they got into trouble with the police. Um, there was a bit of an evening event going on there. A couple of musicians had stayed, uh, uh, staying at the Crown overnight. And one John Taylor, who resides ostensibly at his father's in Auburn, but occasionally slept in the Crown, uh, was there on the night of the 8th of November. Um, the Crown closed at the proper hour but there was a bit of drinking went on afterwards. And uh, suddenly there was a knock at the door and uh, the PC walks into the passage and on the bar perceives a glass with something in it uh, on the shelf, rushes to it, seizes it, smells it and declares it to be sherry. At that point, I'll take a sip of my sherry. <laughs> which the defendant admitted it to be, and that it was hers, which she had not tasted. But the PC had a quick look round the room, pronounced Taylor was drunk, who took great exception to that, and made use of language quite unfit for ears polite. What a wonderful phrase, ears polite. Became much excited, but was held back by Mrs Gould, and thereby the demolition of the PC is prevented. Yeah. Right, and on this evidence, the bench retired, returning, addressed the defendant. They knew she kept a good uh, tidy house. Even the deputy chief constable um, testified to it, and they dismissed the summons, although the policeman had obviously done his proper duty. But then poor old John Taylor, who just happened to be in the pub, he was also charged with being drunk, and that... Uh, and he, but he'd gone to the PC the following day and tried to apologise to him and said he had a bit too much. Mrs Gould stated she did not think the defendant drunk or she should not have given him any drink. And again, the bench retired, non-consultation, and they dismissed the summons. So, yeah, there's a rather melancholy finish to all this that Mrs Gould was only age 42 at this time, but she died suddenly in the spring of the following year. The account of her death is far too melancholy for this Christmas evening presentation, but I think I may well return to it on another occasion because it's very interesting, but sad. Mm. Now we jump way up to 1937. Um, and this is a story, there was a chap who wrote extensively in the North Wilts Herald about country matters. He went under a pseudonym, so he wasn't from the village and he didn't just write about Auburn, although Auburn often featured in his articles. <coughs> this is a tale about a well-trained sheepdog who can sometimes be extremely helpful to his shepherd. And this is of a story recorded in Auburn, illustrating the point. The shepherd went out one morning sent the sheep up onto the downs in the care of the dog. And then the shepherd set him set about turnip packing, uh, turnip picking, I take that to be, or digging. And until he'd packed a supply to set last several days, he packed up his tools, locked his van, and instead of following the sheep up into the downs, which I assume he was supposed to do, he set off for home. Then late in the afternoon, the sheep, sheep came back down um, no shepherd to be seen, but the dog was driving the sheep. And the canine shepherd turned them into the fold, saw they were all safe, stopped there all night and daylight came, and then drove out the sheep and took them back up to the down. Same repeated the next day, the next day and the next day, until the dog had been the shepherd in charge for six days. And then one morning, the farmer happened to look out of the window, noticed the hurdles hadn't been moved, investigated and then found out that the shepherd, an old man who lived alone, was in bed with a broken mug on the floor and three parts empty beer bottle standing near the bed. And in the words of a Wiltshireman, he was so drunk 
he could neither stand up nor lie down without being held up, which is a good phrase again. And the old man had drawn, withdrawn his Michaelmas money, Michaelmas money and had decided to take a week's holiday. <laughs> In Wiltshire parlance, he had gone on the booze for six whole days. Now, I didn't know that was particularly a Wiltshire phrase, gone on the booze, it seems very common. Whereas the previous phrase, neither stand up nor lie down without being held up, I think is rather quaint and rather nice. Oh, there's it. And my last little snippet this evening, <laughs> just in, as they say, old news just in from the North Wilts Herald, 1938. Yeah. Just leave you to ponder this one a moment. <laughs> now the question is would you get away with that sort of advert in this day and age there's absolutely no idea what that could be construed as being but I'm sure I hope Mrs Arkell was satisfied with her advertisement uh, and living at the Malt House, she was probably a, a grand lady. I mean, if you know her, but she obviously wanted this capable man daily. Wow. <laughs> that's that's my little contribution for this evening. I'm going to hand over, I think, now to um, uh, Terry. Uh, may, is it or Cassie? May I just may I just say something there? Because yeah, I sure. Think William, I think William might be able to help us with this one, William Brown, because that would have been his auntie. Or oh, great auntie, I'm not sure. Are you there, William? Perhaps you can enlighten us and you might be able to remember, not remember it, but know what was happening at the time. Yeah, that was Henry Arkell, or Mrs. Henry Arkell, and um, the grandmother of my cousin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so careful. May <laughs> <laughs> I say something, please? With respect to the chap who went out and was helping with the harvest of a Mr. Jason Withers in Victoria. Two brothers Withers went out from Baden uh, and farmed at Charlton in uh, Northern Victoria. Uh, one of the Eustaces, uh, they married a Eustace daughter, one of the Eustaces, he was the head keeper uh, at Ashdown, um, had gone out there as well. So I just wonder uh, whether that Jason Withers is actually a son of, of uh, one of the two people from Baden. Oh, you wondered if it was one of those? Yes, but one could check this, but uh, not well one's... <laughs> oh. Well, that that turns out we we turned to get a really good segue from the rather drunk one man to a um, old parish news cartoon that I managed to find. So, uh, okay, little segment. So, uh, in nineteen thirteen, I don't think the vicar really had enough to be doing. You know, it it comes to something when the vicar is telling the whole parish in the parish magazine how to make a cup of tea. Um, so, um, many people try to make the tea with water that has been boiling half the day. Mm. <laughs> and then goes on. And uh, I, strangely enough, the next year he had weightier things on his mind. But um, yeah. I was dig digging through it. I really couldn't quite believe that. He was being that paternalistic to tell people how to make tea. Presumably, he was fed up with getting given foul tea when he came round to visit. <laughs> More tea, Vicar. <laughs> no. Yes. Oh, so um, oh, so you know, warming your cup, though. That's a really good idea. I might use mm. one. Oh, that's classic, isn't it? Well, you warm the tea, yeah. tea cup. Oh, yeah. Do you not warm your teacup first? Not my teacup. I warm the teapot, but not the teacup. No. I always warm my mug up before I put my pour the uh, tea bag in and pour in the boiling water. There you go. Do you get lots That's of visits from the vicar? <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, I'll be washing out for that one. <laughs> I'll take so, a bit of this. So while, while digging... 
before or after to drop off some carbs. Well, digging through, I came across um, some bits about all born's own health system. So I thought it, it wasn't long enough to make a whole talk, but I thought it'd just be interesting to share a little snippet now. So in 1898, um, they're having a meeting to, to consider the need of a parish nurse. Um, and a working committee set up, we've got a list of names, and then we sort of drop out a little bit from the, the records for a while. Uh, oh, we've got 1898 still. They're still raising money. They're raising a noticeable amount of money. So that sounds sound pretty good. Um, jump forward, 1913, we finally got one, and this is the scheme. And they've not been terribly um, uh, original in the scheme. This is not all born being cutting edge and preceding the NHS, um, they pretty much copied the scheme from what Pusey was offering. But you get various classes of people, householders earning under one pound a week, householders earning over one pound a week, tradespeople, <laughs> and all others not coming under any of the above. And you then paid an annual subscription and you could get a number of free visits. Interestingly, the higher up the scale you went, less free visits you got as well. So it's quite progressive sort of scheme. Um, and if you didn't subscribe, you really had to cough up some money. Um, so a nurse had been gone all the way to London and come back and be had to be trained and then come back. And hey, presto, we have our own all bone health system, which I, you know, I've not really given an awful lot of thought to what happened before the NHS, to be honest, before. But it's interesting to see the parish actually make, making some effort to do something and coming up with a system that is pretty pretty good, really. Um, free at the point of use, of course. Of course, we're all familiar with that. Um, 1923, it's still going. Um, got Baden mer merged in with us. I guess they're, they're being slightly smaller. They get pay, paid in for the... And um, we can see we spent a, £155 on salaries in 1933, so that's not an insubstantial amount of money. Um, and the County Council, now where are we? Yes, you'll notice the second one down, the County Council are giving a grant of £45 by that point. Um, so it's not just being done on donations. Somehow, it's, where the county, where the county is getting the money from, to then um, donate. I don't know, but there we are. Uh, right. So, 1923, they're fundraising. Very jumble, sale of work and jumble sale. A, a fate and a whist drive. Everyone had a whist drive in those days, I think. Um, and the vicar, you know, the, these snippets are from the parish magazine. So this is effectively um, the church saying, hmm, support this, this is a good thing. Um, of course, later on, we've got the NHS has replaced uh, the need for it, really. And the nursing scheme ends up be becoming the uh, nursing. You've got the nursing aids and things being provided. Coming with you. And um, it then goes on to to become the um, nursing fund. You know that the still exists today. Uh, back in. They turn around the turn of the century. They're having hospital Sundays when when money is raised. So we're not just doing the nursing; we're raising money for the hospital. Which is, I guess working on a similar sort of basis, but a wider, wider one. Uh, still more, you get to see the particular offerings that they, they've got. But so some of the collections being dedicated to hospital Sunday, which is still quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> how, 
had to get hospital tickets, which is interesting. Any provisioner has the right to ask for a ticket provided by the provided the doctor recommends the case is suitable for the hospital. Mr. Brown keeps some. That's interesting, and it's not Doctor Brown, so <laughs> uh, don't quite know how that worked. Um, and the vicar's willing to assist. So obviously, there must have been some complaining going on that oh, we can't actually get to use it. Um, and there we are, 1959. Um, the, the district nurse's house was sold, and the assets transferred to the uh, all the all born and Baden sickness and aid fund. So that's my very swift little bit. Terry, um, are you are just, you ready? Just, well, just one thing like that it mm. is still running. The Allborn Baden Aid in Sickness Fund is still running, and yep. today today is administered by Anthony Evans in Farm Lane, and he gets nothing for his services, even less than one hundred and fifty nine pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how much I don't know how much the committee took on that. I hope the nurse got all of it. But if anyone requires any um, implements that you might use if you were ill, such as um, a toilet seat or crutches, Anthony could probably help you, and it doesn't cost anything. And I, we've made use of it a couple of times. Really, really mm -hmm. useful. Yeah. Really useful. It's Amazing. interesting. It's used now about oh, two, three, four times a month mm -hmm. uh, because Anthony's not here a lot. So um, Sandra Barnes and I take it in turns more or less to to um, deal with it. We've got keys to the to the barn, but it is used a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and around at Christmas time, um, people who've had a tough year for one reason or another. Are given a um, a hamper. Wow, I didn't right. know that. That's wonderful. Mm. It, it's interesting. It's just the odd thing. I remember when my mother-in-law came to stay, and she couldn't walk very far, so we borrowed a wheelchair just to take us if we went shopping. We had it with us in case she wanted to, you know, go a bit further than she, uh, she could walk. It's just odd things like that. It's just so useful to have access to a wheelchair for a, you know a couple of weeks, rather than having to you know buy one or or. Mm. Really, really amazing service. Good. Right, Terry, are you ready for your two two poetry pieces? Can you can you click on in a minute? Not just for a second, please. See, because um, uh, okay, because um, the next two bits by me are actually um, short poems. Um, sorry about that, but you'll see um, there's a reason for them. Um, and the first one is, uh, I had a winning entry with it at the WI Prodigy Show in, I think, 1985. And I'm not going to tell you the poem itself. I want you to read it and digest it in your mind, and you'll see my cleverness, shall we say, um, when you see it. And it is just a bit of light relief, and that is... A, a, a chosen word, as you'll see. Thanks, Cassie, if you'd like to turn over now. <laughs> Cassie? Um, sort of a limerick, if you like. Um, but, uh, you have to actually, there's no, point, there's no point me telling you it, you have to read it. Okay. Um, we, we, won't, we won't dwell on it, but if anyone wants a copy of that, I can send it to them. Um, uh, so the the next thing, I think, I think we're going to close the screen down for a minute. Well, if you want to do your next one over the well, well, I've got a cartoon. Everyone yeah. can just amuse themselves with the cartoon briefly, and, the, and you can finish with that one. <laughs> this is not, the. Oh, by the way, Dab, Dab Chick Dan. Dab, this is Dab Chick Dan, who appeared in my father's Auburn Parish News for quite a few years. Dab Chick Dan was the um, brainchild of uh, Darren Barnes 
who was quite a young lad at the time. He was only probably in his early 20s. And um, a lot of people remember Darren. And um, he moved and his family moved to Axminster. Um, but we still keep in touch with him. Um, but he, he was quite a cartoonist. So my next poem, um, <laughs> if you've forgotten already the one I've just given you, uh, it's a take on a well-known proverb, and it was written by me when I was a lot younger. Um, and I framed the finished version and presented it to Harry Shepherd, um, who hopefully well, a good lot of you, if not most of you, will know, who um, farm in Marlborough Road, where John Hill and Chris Hill uh, bought from him. And I'm eternally de indebted to Harry for passing his expert knowledge on to me about everything he knew with mucking out pigs and that's, where, that's how I am where I am today. Um, so here we go. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, try try again. This old proverb has been going round in my brain driving me insane. But do you know how this saying came about? Well, I have a theory, though there may be some doubt as to its authenticity, but in its simplicity, and avoiding duplicity, I'll begin when I were a lad. Saturdays, I worked for Harry Shepherd and his dad, mucking out the cows and the sows in the barn. My mother said, up there, you'll come to no harm. Now, Harry had built a milling machine to mix feed for his pigs. It yeah. had to be seen. Well, one, day, one day he called over his father Fred to help the problem he had in the shed. Can you deliver a card? Now you're friends with Monica again. Okay? What? You okay? Okay. One day he called over his father Fred to help with the problem he had in the shed. My machine won't suck in the corn and the pigs will have no feed for the morn. Right, said Fred as he scratched his head. You want to use corn that the machine can draw in. So stop using stuff in the bin. There is a point to all this. So the machine worked perfectly well for quite a long time until one day it started churning out slime. Again, again, Harry turned around his pipe and said, my boy, I've told you before, but I'll tell you again, if at first you don't succeed, try, oh. try, try, uh, try uh, oh. <laughs> 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 Right, okay, so we're going to talk about a lovely um, article which was sent to the parish news, but the one that Terry's dad ran, and it's going to be based on the reminiscences of Reginald W. Penny, and this is what he sent, this is the letter he sent to the parish news. Um, and he signed himself R.W. Penny, which everybody is slightly concerned about because his name was Reginald Decimus Penny. So we're not quite sure where the W comes from. Maybe it was a mistype from the lady who typed it up. We're not sure. It might have been. So he starts off to the editor of the Allborn magazine. I was very pleased to receive the new edition of the magazine and to know it was being continued. I wish you every success. As an old dab chick, question mark, well, he was born in the village, but he wasn't a dab chick because he moved away in 1928, I think the date was. But I was born on December the 1st, 1902, at the Blue Boar in the Green, whilst the bells were ringing, practicing for Christmas. At least that's what I've been told. <laughs> so if we go to back a couple of years to have a look at Reginald's family. And this census of 1901 
starts with, I hope you've got a screen where you can read this. It's not too tiny for you, but I'll just read it through as well. So yeah. it's um, in Auburn and they're living in Lottage. And Charles Penny is the head. He's 40 years old. He's a worker and he comes, he was born in Manton in Wiltshire. <coughs> Amelia is his wife. She's also, she's also 40. Liz, can I talk, tell you, ask you to get a bit closer to the microphone? It's not coming over very loud. Sorry okay. to interrupt you. Better. Lovely. Thank you. Is that better? Mm. Good. Right. Uh, I'll start at the top then. Charles Penny is the head and he's 40 years old. He's a worker. He's a carpenter. Actually, that word says carpenter. The squiggle on top is to say that it's been agreed by um, the checker who checks the register. And he was born in Wiltshire, uh, in Manton, in fact. Uh, Amelia is his wife. She's also 40. And she comes from Somerset. She was born in Somerset. Their first char um, son, Charles, at that time was 14. He's already working as a carpenter, as in those days, they would have started work quite young. He was born in London, in Kilburn. Oh, sorry, I've missed out Mabel. Sorry, Mabel. Mabel. First daughter is, is Mabel and she's 16. She was born in St. John's Wood. And then there's Charles and then William. What, this one? William is 12. Now they've come down from London and William was born in Manton, which is interesting. Perhaps they've gone back to stay with Charles's family because that's where he came from. There's John, who is another son, he's eight. He was born in Berkshire at Lambourne, St. Woodland, 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 Lambourne, Lambourne Woodlands, yeah, quite yeah. tiny up there. Yeah. Uncle Jack. Then we have Ava, Ava, who is six. She was also born in Lambourne Woodlands. Mm. James is four. He was born in the same place. Dorothy is only one. So she might have been nearer to two. This is the year in which they were. So she, this was the year in which she was one. She was also born in, Lam in Lambourne Woodlands. So they moved around quite a bit, didn't they? But we know that by 1902, they were in, um, in Allborn, because we know that that's where um, Reginald was born. I just wanted to give a little bit of an interesting fact about Charles Penny, and this is from Graham Palmer's History of Fires in Allborn. He tells us the earliest known names of firemen are Walter Lawrence, Jr., and John Jerram, who were both in the 1891 Brigade. The first known captain was Mr. Penny, the then landlord of the Blue Boar. That was in 1903. And very soon we're going to see that actually Reginald Penny was born in the Blue Boar. And a little snippet about the fire brigade at that time, because it's just such an amazing institution. And this is quite a nice little story. So in 1903, by then, the two fire engines were some 120 years old, but were still giving sterling service. A newspaper report in 1904 of a joint fire drill between the Ramsbury and Auburn brigades mentioned that Auburn's engines caused considerable amusement, if not admiration. The men were very surprised at the capability of both Adam and Eve. <laughs> well, considering they were so old, it's not surprising. And here we are. Here's a picture of Adam and Eve. Oh, um, people know, of course, that they are now up in the church, but this is a lovely one because they're, this is in their working mode. They have their buckets here and they have a light. The bubbles is um, at the door. And this is um, Billy Loveday standing with Adam and Eve. Billy Loveday was part of the fire service as well. And remember that name because Reginald mentions him later on in his letter to the parish news. But that's, um, I think, a, a, a really nice picture of them because it's a working picture. And he's got his hand kind of quite, um, you know, th this is a fire engine and it's, you know, I'm very kind of proud of it somehow. He's standing there upright 
weather vane on the bar. Ready to go Street. when the fire bell goes. And I've, I've just realised, I suspect he's got a nozzle in his hand. Yes, he's got, he's got something down here ready to... Yeah, to, that's to, a nozzle. It's a nozzle to attach it to, to something and off they go. Do, they, do the fire engines in the church have a light on them? I don't remember yeah. seeing it. So this is one of the, yeah, so they, they have, you know, I, I like the fact that it's got the light there. So they would have been called out whether it was, you know, daylight or nighttime. They had the, the capability of uh, providing themselves with some light. Um, Liz, um, mm -hmm. the, the last time one of those fire engines were um, out of the church was in 20, 2012 when we had 90th anniversary of the opening of the Memorial Hall. Um, I borrowed the smaller um, fire, fire engine and we had it on display outside of the Memorial Hall and that's the last time because the, the wheels are very sort of brittle and yes. uh, they're likely to do a lot of damage if they're moved again. So mm. probably that was the last time. Mm. Mm, thank you for that, Terry. Yes, I mean they look very hard, don't they? It must have been really difficult to pull them to, to get to get them anywhere. Really, not much fun. Water, be heavy. Mm -hmm. So let's go back <clears throat> to um, Reginald. I was born on December the first. <clears throat> sorry, in 1902, at the Blue Boar on the Green, whilst the bells were ringing. That's what he was told. Here is one of the earliest pictures we have of the Blue Boar. It's not from 1902 but it does look pretty, pretty bare compared to what it is now. Um, there aren't any pretty baskets of flowers anywhere. This is probably more or less what it was like when we moved to the village in 1986, I think. You've got a very plain um, sign up here. There's no restaurant, there's no steps. You can see there's indentations in the grass where people have come up from the road. Hmm. Uh, okay. So here's the um, the sign, and here are the indentations. Um, and it, it's it, it's quite bleak in a way, isn't it? Um, I think it's only in the last 25, 30 years that we've started making things look prettier and having lots of tubs of flowers. And uh, we started um, becoming perhaps a little bit more open air um, uh, interested and we've had tables and things outside for people to sit at. So it would in some ways have resembled what the blue boar looked like in 1902. Right. And here we have Reginald's baptismal record. 1903, February, so he was born in December, baptized in February, 1903. Reginald Decimus, his parents are Charles, William and Amelia in Auburn, his father's a carpenter. And the um, ceremony was performed by W.A. Butler, curate in charge. Now remember that name because he pops up again later on when we go further down the story. And that's, um, that's the baptismal certificate for Reginald Decimus. Okay. We moved to the cottage next to the old Wesleyan chapel, where we call the top of Lottage. Well, this is a lovely old picture that we've got of Lottage Road. There's Goddard's Lane going down here. This could be one of the cottages where the Pennies lived. I mean, do you think some of these people might be Pennies? We don't know. They are all very um, kind of standing here, looking very proud to be, to be photographed. And they're actually smiling, which often people in old photographs aren't. I love the fact that these ladies have got smiles on their faces. And you've got a little boy here standing next to his mum, probably. Um, we've got a horse and cart down the road. We've got people on the bank here. So this would have been very much what, what Lottage looked like at this time. One interesting point, this thatched cottage is still there. And in fact, it's being rethatched at the moment because we happened to be to drive down there recently and the thatchers are working on this cottage. It looks like it could do with a rethatch here as well. Just a single um, guy doing it. They're going very, very slowly. 
Is it? I don't <laughs> fancy thatching in the winter. I think he's probably got a hard job at this yeah. time of year to be thatching. I, I've, I've been watching him from our bathroom window, <laughs> as you can. Um, as you do. <laughs> and, and he's got tarps over it in the rain. Mm. And he's, suspend, he's got a scaffold up as well. And actually puts the bottom of the tarp over the scaffold and then works underneath it like a sort of rather improvised tent. <laughs> well, there you go. If he spends as much time talking to everybody who walks past as he does talk to Pam and I when we, we walk down there, then I, I, I'm not at all surprised to hear that it's going slowly. <laughs> <laughs> it's all like that. It sounds like the Thatcher who was thatching in the butts recently mm. because he was very <laughs> chatty. It's the same man. Yes. Same it? man. Oh. There you go. <laughs> well, it's nice that he takes, you know, takes time to. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the old Wesleyan Chapel. Well, here we have a picture of the old Wesleyan Chapel, and here it is tucked away here behind another row of thatch cottages. Um, and there you've got the. We're not sure. Which, yeah, we're not sure whether maybe the Penn Estate lived here. Maybe they lived here. We just know that it was next to the old Wesleyan Chapel. The, the, the cottage at the top of Lottage Row um, would be the one on the top of the chapel. Where the, so you where think it's these here? Lived. Yeah, mm. could well be. Chapel. Those would have been the pictures of the first, the first houses that, that we looked at in the previous slide. That's, that's what we knew was. Sorry, that Terry. One is top of Lottage oh. Road. Oh. You're breaking up a bit, Terry. <laughs> yeah, I say, um, I've always known that cottage there that you've got in the picture as the top road. <laughs> this one? Or this one? Yeah. That uh, one. one, okay. On one on the left. Oh, this one? Ah, oh, that's really interesting. Thank you for that. Right. Yeah. Yes. So that's the one. I like the sign which says Baden and Lambourne going up the hill as well. Um, right, so let's go on. As a child, I used to find great fun sliding down the banks on Baden Hill on old trays which we used to collect from the rubbish dump, which was known as the tin pit. I wonder if any of your readers can remember this. Well, we have a lovely old picture of Baden Hill. And here is the tin pit. Mm -hmm. I think it was also called the chalk pit at some point, wasn't it, Terry? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you can just imagine the young boys going up there, finding any old bits of metal when it was snowing, and then finding a nice bank, maybe this one here, where they could just grab onto this slide and whiz down into the road. And of course, there weren't loads of cars going up and down. So they weren't, it wasn't dangerous. But again, it, it's wonderful to look at all these amazing people, very stylized, all kind of posing for the camera. I, I particularly like this lady here. She's obviously got one hand with this child and another one with this child. I'm not quite sure why. What is she, is she trying to say to them, no, don't move because if you move, it'll spoil the photograph because you had to stay still for so long in those days. I don't know. And they've got, they all seem to be very smart and very clean. Yeah, there's one handing behind, hiding behind the lamppost there, which is a bit of a shame, really. I bet she got a bit annoyed when she saw <laughs> that she wasn't in view anymore. It looks like they've got their Sunday best on. I think they have. And he's got a lovely straw boater. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, they wouldn't be like that in the weekday. And the no. little girls down with their, with their Everybody's hats, got on. hats on. They've it. all got their smart beautiful straw hats yeah. and the very white road because of course it's chalk yes no no tarmac in sight and the mud would have got worn away so what i just find that's absolutely fascinating um and interesting enough in 1986 when we first came to the village it was a very cold winter and everybody went up to the the, the farm the fields at, at the farm up the top of, of the road just around the corner really and we all spent a day sliding down to Baden, to, Baden. To, the road. to the road. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yes, you see, Reg Reginald, <laughs> people went on doing that for a long time. 
I remember standing and watching old Mr. <coughs> Jerram making barrels at his Cooper's shop, which was about where the Memorial Hall stands. <coughs> so John Jerram Cooper shows up on the 1891 census and again in 1901. In 1911, his widow Sarah Jane is living in Oxford Street with sons George, Alfred, Francis and Wilfred. Now Francis Daniel married Clara Bowes and in 1939 they were listed at Myrtle Cottage next to the Memorial Hall. So it could be this is where the family lived in the early 1900s. Uh, this is a lovely picture of old Mr. Jerram. Um, he, he was one of the bell ringers. He was one of the firemen that we heard about earlier. It seems like the great and the good, you know, if you were in the fire, fire brigade, you were also a bell ringer and, and vice versa. But again, he's looking very smart because he was having his photograph taken. So um, if we think about Myrtle Cottage, let's go on to the next picture which, and this quite possibly was where they were living. And again, I, I just love this picture because it is one of the um, opening by Lord Methuen of the Memorial Hall. And it, it's a lovely one because it's not, a, it's not one where I think everybody is standing, you know, listening particularly. I think they all seem to be quite relaxed around here. And the people over here are kind of looking over to see what's going on. Um, We're all waiting. It's just so fascinating. There's so much detail there. What were you going to say, John? Can I, can I say that in case anybody is confused, in the 1939 register, there are actually two places in Albourn that are referred to as Myrtle Cottage. There's the one in Goddard's Lane that is still called Myrtle Cottage. And there's this cottage here beside the Memorial Hall mm. that both of them also appears under the name Myrtle Cottage. Um, although I don't think it's called that anymore. Mm. The other thing which, which is, I think, so amazing is, of course, next year, it's going to be the 100th anniversary of the opening of, of the Memorial Hall. And obviously, you know, people will be putting on various exhibitions but it was such it is such an amazing institution and I just think it's so wonderful that a hundred years ago to commemorate the people who died in the first world war they didn't want to put up just a, a stone cross or something which was just going to be a symbol they wanted something which was living and which was going to continue to provide somewhere for the people of the village to go and enjoy themselves and to take part in all different activities and that's exactly what they did. They had the foresight and the wisdom and the, um, the courage and, I don't know, the enthusiasm to put together this amazing hall, which we still have today. I just, I just love that. And all the fundraising that they did paid off hugely. So this is, and this actually, this picture, I think, was given, um, to, was provided by William Brown, I think Joe said. So it's a particularly lovely one and very clear. You can really see the faces. Uh, it, was, it was John Brown who was it was John? The, Sorry. Yeah, who was at the talk at the beginning, but he left because he couldn't hear anything. Ah, oh, okay. Thanks. Can yeah. I just, can I just say something? Yeah. Um, the current Lord Methuen, um, who was the grandson of the Lord Methuen in in the picture, he lives in Northamptonshire somewhere. When we had the nine, uh, 2012 90th anniversary, I invited the grandson to um, come and you know be our guest, which he agreed to do. Um, unfortunately, uh, he asked if this was going to be a rededication of the hall. And I said, no, no, it's a reenactment. Oh dear, I don't think that's really important enough for me to come. So um, he didn't. <laughs> He didn't, and, uh, and I got a colleague. I got a colleague from work who uh, took his place. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, if we do a reenactment, I rather fancy wearing one of these lovely hats, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll have to grow in the stars. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. I love the fact that there are children there, but and the windows open, and I just can just imagine people were perhaps up there looking out, so they got a good view. I think you can okay, actually make so out that someone stood on the windowsill. 
<laughs> okay. I often wonder what <coughs> happened to our mates in those early days. Vin Ronce, Bert Westall, Fatty Scanlon, Reg Osborne, to mention a few. Oh. I love the fact that he's put Vin Ronce in inverted commas. I don't know why. Maybe that was, again, the person who did the typing. Um, Bert Westall is a name that we know. I'm not going to talk about these because I'm afraid I didn't have time to do much research and I wasn't sure how long this was going to go on for. And Fatty, poor old Fatty Scanlon, honestly. <laughs> you not be able to call anybody that these days. <laughs> then, of course, there were the exciting events such as carnivals, bonfires on top of Baden Hill. Um, the, the bonfires on top of Baden Hill, again, took place in the tin pit because we have other reminiscences from other people to say that they used to go up Oxford Street um, to the tin pit on the Guy Fawkes and they would always have bonfires up there. Um, and I've just, we've just included um, a picture of the fair, which now, of course, does um, come when we have carnivals or when we, have, when we, used, when we celebrate the feast there is a fair. There didn't always be, a, there wasn't always a fair there because we do have a program from one of the carnivals and there was no mention of a fair. That was in the mid 1930s. But now we do have a fair. Um, and it looks very, very busy. A huge Dodgem area here. I think this was from 1946, 46, something like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, you can see you've got the stables there. Um, right off along um, towards Hungerford. So I think Reginald really enjoyed village life, didn't he? He took part in everything as a young man would have done. <clears throat> I wonder how many of the older Auburn people remember Billy Loveday's foundry in Lottage Road. Mm -hmm. As kids, we used to go down on a Friday, which was the day they did the casting. I remember the old portable steam engine belching out steam and smoke to drive the furnace and seeing them pouring the molten metal into the molds. And we have several pictures of Loveday's Foundry and this is a particularly nice one because you have all the workers out there. Here's um, Billy Loveday again, who was standing by Adam and Eve earlier. I think he's got a pipe in his hand possibly or something, another, maybe a tool. It looks extremely untidy <laughs> and busy and active. And it's a, such a vivid description of the casting day with the noise and the smoke. Um, and I, I was thinking about this and thinking about the, the bell foundries that we used to have in the village. And they would have been the same, really. They would have been untidy. They would have been belching out smoke and steam and and noise in order to, 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 to make the bells. We think of Allborn as being a very kind of pretty, clean, dare I say, or almost um, postcard perfect village, but certainly during previous centuries, it would have been quite an industrial place. And perhaps this is the last, one of the last industrial bits that there, there was in the village. Hmm. So, okay, right. These are my recollections of the village as it was, or as I remember it. I hope this will be interesting. Best wishes for your future. So I just wanted to include a little bit about the pennies. And John has done a family tree. So you've got um, Charles and Amelia at the top. You've got Mabel, who married Albert Stacy, the baker. Yeah. And um, you've got Charles Cornelius Penny here. The same name as his father. Um, Fanny, well, sorry, Charles married Fanny at Applin. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about those again in a minute. You have William, um, uh, John, who's called Jack, um, and um, <laughs> Eva Penny, who married John Walcott. Yes. Walklet. John Foster Walcott. Walklet. Walklet. Walklet, yes. And we're going to talk about those again in a little, a little bit uh, in more detail. James, Penny, Dorothy, Joseph, and at the end, Reginald. 
Um, I'm not going to go into more detail on that, but I do have a little bit of interesting information. So we know that Mabel married Albert Stacy and they lived in New Tree Cottage. Ida Gandhi in the heart of the village tells us that Mabel was a skilled seamstress who made the clothes for James McAvoy's play, The Village Wedding in 1910. Um, and that's another very interesting bit of all born history. The fact that we put on a village play where the actors were actually village people. John was known as Jack. He ran a bakery in Ramsbury. James was the father of Mervyn Penny, who was a folk musician. And Dorothy married Joseph Alder and lived at Neal's in South Street. So in 1911, Eva is registered as a domestic and living at the vicarage with the Reverend and Mrs. Butler, who we know was actually the curate who actually did the, 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 the yeah, well, the curate who did the baptism um, and then became the vicar afterwards. And Ava married John Foster Walklet, as stated in the Parish Magazine of 1920. Parish News, Marriages, 1920, January the 28th, John Foster Walklet and Eva Penny were married. And here we have another little story um, due to some research that Joe jo did. During World War II, Ava came to live with her sister Mabel and her husband Albert Stacy in the square. Their son Ivor is seen in the picture on the left, collecting boxes for recycling. And the recycling was organized by Muriel Foster, who is very well known in all as being the lady who was very keen on fishing and loved children. And she would always give money to the young children when the fair came around so they could have a free ride on the dodgems. I wish she'd been around when my kids were small because I used to spend a fortune on the fair. <laughs> and Dorothy actually also came with um, the family and would help with the, re the collecting as well. And there is Ivor. And it's um, interesting, he's got pictures of cars at the background because he was famous for, st for starting Janetta Cars Limited with his brothers in 1956. And anyone interested in motor racing will know of the immense influence this company has had on the motor racing industry. And I'm thankful to my husband for telling me about that because he's obviously a very keen uh, uh, a racing and motor car enthusiast. And John has got a lovely blog all about this story in Auburn Archives. Joe has, sorry, if you want to know, if you want to go and have a look a little bit in more detail about um, Ivor and what he did after the war with his brothers. And we also have a postcard, which probably was sent by Charles because you've got a C down here. He'd married Fanny Aplin in 1919, uh, just arrived home, um, we're right tomorrow, I received your letter this morning. Eva is coming down on Monday and I shall see her Monday before um, she leaves Wilton of Bondis Love. And it's sent down to Weymouth. Now it, it's interesting because we've found out that Charles and Fanny married in Weymouth. So that kind of makes a tie in with the, the postcard. Mm -hmm. But that's a lovely picture, a bird's eye view of Auburn prior to 1919. Very green, lots of trees, um, quite open in a way, it's not nearly so many houses built and um, just up in this corner here would have been the tin pit much loved by Reginald <laughs> so that's uh, an interesting little snippet another little bird's eye view of what was going on at the time and just to end I wanted to go back to a picture of Reginald in the band in 1922 um, this is a new picture of the band which we got recently here's here's Reginald up here and you could take him out and blow him, blow him up. And here he's looking incredibly smart with his tie. Beautiful hat. Amazing. Um, and we know that one of the things Reginald did for the band was to collect money. And he was apparently very, very good at it. There is a story um, that um, somebody was listening to the band in, in Swindon and, and Reginald was there, not in his capacity of, of collecting of money, but just listening. And somebody came up from Ramsbury who said, oh, you're safe from Reg. He's not collecting today. If you'd been here, you know, you wouldn't have got away without giving any money to the band. He had a very, very uh, good reputation from of being able to get money from people. He was a collector for the band for 10 years, um, but he left the village in 1928, according to um, Graham Palmer's history of the band, in order to look for work. 
and he died in 1995. And that's that's it. So goodbye and happy Christmas. Can, can I can I just mention something? Can I just mention something about this? Um, we, in the band pictures, Albert yeah. Stacy in the front row in the middle, as we know. Yeah. Albert was Albert was a baker, and um, he and Mabel ran the shop um, mm. where Warwick and uh, now there. and uh, their son Leslie emigrated emigrated to Australia after his parents died, and he was a baker also, and he. Um, took the ingredients of the lardy cake with them, the Wiltshire lardy cake, uh, which, which is always very popular in Auburn, and very popular with the Americans when they were stationed here. Anyway, Leslie took the lardy cake with him to Perth and he made it famous there. And to this day, I understand. How about that? <laughs> I don't think the Terrence knew it. I had to introduce them. Oh. Amazing, amazing. Um, does anybody so, uh, else have any comments or questions or anything they want to add? No, it's too much. Okay. Well, Mervyn Penny uh, lived in the Blue Boar as a small child, um, even if his, it must have been his grandfather was Charles Penny, is that right? Yes. And Charles Penny worked for the cooks. I notice you call him a carpenter. Uh, it was Mervyn who told me the story, which I, I think Terry's repeated about uh, the cooks fetching the woman down from Snap into the village. Oh, Ra Rachel Fisher, you mean the last, the last uh, inhabitant of Snap? Yeah. All mm. mm. oh, right. I think it's really interesting how. Every all the you keep getting the same people coming up time and again in different capacities, and they either intermarried or they were famous for, for different things. It, it's um, really interesting to see how everything kind of fits together in village life. Mm. Well, thank you, Liz, for the, because that came over beautifully after I'd spoken up. Thank you. Good. Oh, I'm so glad. And thanks, I must say thank you very much to Jo, because this is mostly her research. Um, and um, I, I, we just found the pictures and put it together, hopefully in a way that made it um, real. I think it's lovely if you can see pictures mm. to represent what you're, what you're hearing about. It makes it become um, live and you can, you can picture it and, you know, visualise it. Even, even more so, um, if you look at the band picture again, um, yeah. if you... Remember the, the poem that I spoke about some minutes ago, and his dad, Fred. Well, Fred is in this band picture, um, middle row on the left hand side, in the light coloured jacket, That's holding right. um, a cord. Cor and, and he was a very fine cornet player. That's it. Um, he was a very fine cornet player. And Harry also was a very fine cornet player. Um, who in the band? He's not in that picture, of course. But there's lots of familiar faces on there, to, to my uh, immediate knowledge. But William William Brown will also recognise both of his grandfathers on here. Um, May, um, Captain Brown on the left, uh, sitting down. That's it. And um, Tom Worth on the right, next to uh, the man, see the shield at the bottom. Um, the next one up to the right now. That one? Or next that one, one to the right now, without instrument. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm. We mm -hmm. actually do have the names of all of those people. We do know the names of all of those um, people in the band. Um, but I didn't think I'd have time to go through them all, and I've gone over time anyway, as it is. But we do have the names of all of them, which is really, really good. Really good. And it, it's lovely. It's that Auburn Silver Bat Prize Band, 1922. Um, Reginald would have been 20 yeah. at the time. I think it's interesting that they're not wearing uniform. Um, yes. And I, I believe that there was a point, and I think it probably was around this time, uh, when the, the, old, the old uniforms either looked 
true tatty or something. But anyway, they, they, they didn't want to carry on with uniforms, but they decided that rather than spend the money on uniforms, they would prefer to spend the money on new instruments. Um, and uh, the, for a time, they abandoned uh, wearing a uniform. Good for them. <laughs> Goes Shall I stop sharing? I'll stop sharing. There we go. I'll leave it to John to say goodbye. Well, <laughs> yes, all there is to say is uh, I hope you've enjoyed the evening. There's quite a few of you who have stayed with us. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and let's hope that sometime soon we can get back to having these meetings actually in person in the, cha in the chapel.